Welcome. This is the January 9th Jail and Zones production user call. We have on today Doug, Dave, Jamie, myself, Michael, and we hope others will roll in. We have moved this to Tuesday to accommodate several people, and one of those is Doug Rabson. And Doug, I would love to hear what you are working on regarding the OCI runtime. Um, so a few things going on at the moment. Um, just in the process of refreshing the various ports associated with Podman and Builder, and hopefully we'll get that pushed this week. Um, it's missed the cut for the quarterly, but I think maybe there's, Dave was talking about trying to merge that back to the, to the quarterly build branch. We'll see about that. Yeah, that's easy um, to do. Yeah. <laughs> Not much different in that. I mean, it's just keeping it fresh. Um, what else? So the we had we went through the formal process of establishing a working group with the OCI um, organization to to define a FreeBSD extension to OCI runtime. Um, that's been accepted by the the board of you know, the OCI. So the next step will probably be to create a GitHub repository this is part of their process that they seem to go through for working groups, at least some of them. Um, so we'll create a, a GitHub repository where we can um, organize the various contributors. Um, we can um, use the issues system to, you know, um, keep track of work items, that kind of thing. We can commit proposals for different aspects of the of the spec. So that's that's the next step is for me to engage with the OCI folk, ask them to create a repository, and that will give us a place to to work that's not going to um, distract other people in the OCI kind of wider community. There were a number of people expressed interest in being a contributor on the PR. Um, but they'll still be subscribed to that PR. So I'll update the, the pull request that we made to, to start the working group once we have the um, the new Git repo set up and people can migrate over to that. I guess we could you end up using the discussions feature on GitHub, but maybe that doesn't really matter. But we can certainly uh, talk about perhaps setting up a regular um, VC meeting. How regular it would be, I don't, I'm not sure we need to discuss this or about what, how, how often it should be. Do we even need one or can we do everything async? I mean, in terms of working groups, this is a relatively uncomplicated thing. We've got to agree on how to describe a jail. We've got to agree on, on how to do resource controls for the containers. And anything else I've forgotten. Those are the two two top of mind things for me. I have found that the the synchronous meetings are very good for vocalizing incomplete or not yet complete ideas. Mm. It's helpful for any design process. So even having people talk to themselves with the occasional input of others has been invaluable. So. For what it's worth, I'm happy to coordinate when you think it's appropriate, or just have people jump on this call. It's entirely up to you. Mm -hmm. So we could we could use this part of this call, perhaps, um, if that made sense. If there was if the bandwidth was sufficiently low, the OCI folk have basically offered use of potential use of their Zoom account mm -hmm. to for more larger reg um, regular meetings. But again, we just have to work out what we need. Sure. And it sounds like they've been great to work with. Yeah, I mean, Samuel Karp, who's the the author of Run J, is um, basically he's chairman of the board of of the OCI. So, ah, okay, he <laughs> that's Karp with a K. Oh, it is. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, so he knows how their processes work, and he's been very helpful getting through this. Um, he. As author of Runjay, he wants to be involved in this process. 
although I suspect that his bandwidth will be limited since his day job is quite demanding. Cool. Any questions for Doug? Oh, uh, yes, I do. I do. So um, uh, I, 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 uh, I'm not a uh, OCI aficionado. I guess that's an English word, right? I like knowing all of the internals and everything. But mm -hmm. it got me wondering. Um, Andrzej, can you that... be any louder? Maybe closer oh, somehow. Yep. You've, you've How about this? Beautiful. Okay. So I was wondering. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, um, you know, philosophy wise, originally, since many of these. Um, uh, OCI containers were built to run a single application. So mm -hmm. they always put their output into STD out and, you know, something like Docker log would parse the STD out and show you in, in, in inside the Docker log subcommand, which is, you know, very beautiful, very nice. It's, it's manageable and everything. But in our case, a jail could be a single process or it could be a whole operating system. And I was wondering, um, is there any extensions or namespaces or anything in the OCI right now where it allows to define things like operating system hooks, like dtrace or BPF trace? Or is that like nothing given to, you know, that people are working on at all? Because th that would be very interesting from an operational point of view that I noticed was lacking. I don't know of anything off the top of my head. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I know that there's um, a possibly stale Stellaris extension to um, the OCI runtime that we could have a look at to see whether that covers dtrace. Hmm. But I don't I'm sure I remember re skim reading through it, and I don't think it does. Um, there's very wide use of eBPF um, in Linux, in yes. Linux network, um, basically network containers. So if you look at if you look at Kubernetes, the, the the way things work for networking with Kubernetes is you run some kind of container on all the nodes in your stack that manages the network. And typically, it's a privileged container with with access to the host networking. So and and it sets up the network for you. Um, so eBPF is a thing. Having said that, these are always privileged containers, and they're always going to just PF in the host namespace. So I I'm I don't have a good answer for your question. It's an interesting one though. Okay, because because if it's not, maybe we can. If it's not, then maybe uh, the free BASD extensions might be a good place to start and then move them into the, uh, what do you call that? The root namespace. I yeah. Think that... I mean, I like the idea of having dtrace hooks for container uh, lifecycle events. I think that could be potentially useful. Yeah, we created that by accident in one of our products where like, you know, developers put whatever dtrace hook they're interested in and we mm. log or monitor them depending on the scenario. <laughs> and uh, for some reason, I thought that this could be an actual, you know, methodology of shipping software. Like developers now can ship to operators to what also log, you know? So that that, that could mm. also be very interesting. Mm. Um, so, yeah. um, another thing that occurred to me in Podman at least, um, container lifecycle events are tracked and logged um, and you can examine the, the event log with Podman. I'm guessing that's probably also the case with Docker, but yeah. So Podman, Podman acts as a centralized information resource for containers starting and stopping and, and suspending and all these other things and does give you um, access to that log. Can you describe that mechanism? Like... Uh... Uh, so every, so each, I'm going to describe it from the point of view of Podman. Docker will be different because Docker has a, a long running daemon that can keep track of these things. With Podman, most of the time you don't have a long running daemon, but each container has an instance of something called Conmon, which is reading the standard in and stud, uh, stud out and studder 
logging them um, and it keeps track of when the container exits. And this is the traditional Linux container model of a single PID owning the container. It might have sub, sub PIDs, it might have children, but when that PID exits, then the container is done. So Conmon waits for that. When the container PID exits, it runs Podman with um, a special subcommand of Podman that says, hey, the container's died or the container's exited with this return code or whatever it happens to be. And then that turns into the, or gets added to the Podman event log. And is that a, a tool entirely internal to them or using, oh, what's handling the storage events and other events? Uh, I'm drawing a blank here. Um, so Conmon is shared between Podman and Cryo. Cryo is a, is a Kubernetes um, focused container runtime. Runtime? I think engine is the, is the right jargon. Okay. And my, I guess my rephrase my question is, did they have to roll that from scratch or are they using, oh, what's the term I'm looking for? The event daemon used for like storage, hot plugging and laptop closing and you name it. Uh, complete draw. Uh, Dbus? Dbus, thank you. Yes. Okay. <laughs> no, um, there aren't any there aren't any strong links to Dbus other than in Podman, other than the Linux system D kind of thing that I try to ignore. Okay. That's cool. that's that's it can, that's heavily linked to Dbus, but apart from that, Dbus is not a thing. Okay. Um that's a pretty good segue to Entrenig, your work on Collabora Office, which at first we thought, oh no, it is so system D specific. We need oh to God. bring in <clears throat> mid virtualization, et cetera, et cetera. But you actually dove into it. Would you like to talk about that briefly? Yes. Yes. Cool. Okay. Collabora, those who are not aware, is the continuation of what was called previously LibreOffice Online. LibreOffice Online was the online version of LibreOffice for collaboration, but they were not maintaining it because the foundation, the Open Document Foundation, was didn't have that much funds to maintain all of that code as well. So they only maintained LibreOffice for, well, the source code and three major operating systems, uh, Linux, Mac, and Windows. So Collabora, the company, got, gets into the code of um, uh, the code of uh, LibreOffice Online, aka LOL with double O, and um, and they start uh, patching it and maintaining it in order to make the Collabora Online system, which is you know Google Docs alternative. So their official model of deployment is using Docker, of course. The other model that they have is, okay, deb packages. They actually provide a deb and an RPM repository, very good maintained. And of course, you can also compile from the sources. So as a uh, dum dum, I decided that I should try the Linux packages. You know, deb and RPM sounds good. And I extracted them and I started running it, had a lot of issues, things that were, were very easily debuggable. Uh, you know, all of the dependencies were available on the um, uh, in the guest operating systems, by the way. So, uh, you know, apt install, one or two libraries, everything was done and is all good. Under so, JL Compat start... Linux or on a real system? In in a Charut Compat Linux and okay, a JL Compat you. Linux, okay. all works fine. The problem started that when I started running Collabora online, I was getting a specific error that says... Uh, e not found, as in the file or directory does not exist. And it was trying to connect to a Unix socket, to be very specific here. It was trying to connect to a Unix socket. Now, uh, 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 I, I, I mean, I, I even taught operating systems, and to my knowledge, Unix socket is a named pipe on the file system. I'm like, okay, does it not have permissions? Turns out it does. Everything is fine. So luckily, we have clean water, which means we can have dtrace for Linux containers. And now I'm dtracing Linux code. And when I'm when I'm, I'm I'm looking what's happening in there, it's actually calling the Linux socket and the Linux bind 
um, uh, system calls. Uh, Dum Dum Me doesn't notice that the name of the the name of the path starts with a null. No, sorry, with a slash zero, slash forward slash. You know, an actual zero value. Uh, so uh, the other slash Michael, by the way. So the, like the, the Windowsy thing, whatever that's called. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, I I do not notice that in the beginning. Chat GPT, however, does for some reason that oh, like your DTRS output has a zero in there. Um, apparently, it, it, Linux has this idea that's called an abstract socket, right? So when it starts with a uh, zero value and then some random name, that is not written into the file system. That is kept as some kind of a file descriptor inside the memory of the application. And the point is of that is for uh, threads or child processes who talk back with you without the need to write a socket file on the file system itself. They call this abstract sockets. I looked into the compat layer of uh, FreeBSD uh, FreeBSD is GL compat layer, and there is a comment that says we currently do not support uh, <laughs> abstract sockets, uh, basically. Uh, and luckily, um, I have no idea about the internals there, but if anyone can, you know, guide me, there would be fine. I was wondering if if the Linux application requested an abstract socket, can we internally convert it into a socket pair? There is a library and uh, an implementation in FreeBSD called the uh, socket pair, which creates two sockets, which is very similar to the idea of 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 of, of uh, an abstract socket, which does also return multiple, you know, does return multiple things. So I'm not sure about that, but I, I might be wrong. Uh, another idea that I had in my mind is, okay, let's create a file descriptor in memory that is not bound to the file system. Uh, an in-memory file, an in-memory file descriptor, and then do bind the abstract socket to that on the compat layer and return back the value to Linux. Should work fine. Maybe again, I don't know. I'm not that with deep knowledge in kernel programming. Um, so this was my Collabora Linux side of things. There's also the FreeBSD side of things, which I guess is not in the context of today's call. That's just basically a lot of problems with building and make files and then die GNU, sorry, the GNU audio tools and then stuff like that. So uh, that, that's the story there. And, but good job, ChatGPT. It actually, you know, ate the documentation of Linux socket and detrace output. And it told me it starts with a zero dum-dum. How, how did you miss that? Like, mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. Um, yeah, that's the long story short version of this. So can anyone think of other tools that have needed uh, abstract sockets on Linux? If someone made a comment, clearly they needed it for something at some point, but that's obviously not daily or hourly or else we'd hear more about it. I mean, when, when you were describing it, I was just thinking, why is somebody trying to reinvent socket pair? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you if you have a child that you want to talk back to, you you give them one end of the socket pair and keep track. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, no kidding. I guess so... uh, with abstract sockets, you you just have a name, and so they don't need to be passed to descriptor as long as they open up something else with the same yeah name in whatever I don't know process group or however they decide that this namespace exists. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's got a little bit of more convenience over socket pair, but yeah, it, it's yeah. an ugly hack. Antronik, do you think they might be open to just, you know, having that done in a more traditional manner? Um, if, the, if, it's a, if it's a well-established way of doing it, that shouldn't be too controversial. There's a lot of code that says if def abstract socket defined, you know, so mm. I don't think it's it's a good idea to think about doing and, and I'm sure they have their reasons because it's a massive application with a lot of committers. I'm sure they have their reasons mm -hmm. for why they did that. Um, what I'm thinking of is how to get the free BSD built done. Again, it's a bit off topic, but the longer story short version is that they have a circle CI uh, job on free BSD 13.1. Um, so it's it's a bit old, but I I took the exact steps of Circle CI. Also, what happened to build.sh? Why do I need to parse a YAML file with my eyes to figure out what's happening in a in a job? That's that's a whole different story. So okay, I, I run the exact commands. 
<clears throat> AudioConf and GMake do not complain anymore. It builds, but as far as I can tell, there are there are some mismatches because there are a couple of binaries and a couple of shared objects that it doesn't generate. That uh, when I do make check or make test to run the test suite, I get a lot of errors. So I think I'll be spending. I'll be busy this week, so I'll be spending next week figuring out how to bring their uh, Circle CI setup to FreeBSD fourteen, and maybe at the same time, because luckily the Linux compat layer is loaded as a module, so it might be also a good idea to just uh, you know modify the code on the fly on FreeBSD fourteen, load it as a module, and see what 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 we're getting there. Um, I'm not very familiar with with kernel development on that side too much. If if I do mess up the system, should I expect a panic? Or just the kernel module will crash and get unloaded. My if the kernel module the crashes, Mac. then that's that's crashing the kernel. Okay, they're not exactly. running a in a in a kind of an isolation environment. Okay, okay. That's, that's what what not gave us virtual machines. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's not Minix. No cake for you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Then, then in that case, I have a, also look at. Um, I think it was called Fura. Kira, Kira with a Q, K I R A. That's a Kemu. Uh, what do you call that? Kira Kemu, I guess. That's a very nice system to run Kemu in a way that it can also move the VM back in its state. I don't know. Does that make sense? We use that in in in, in security operations a lot. So. Uh, uh, like it's not a snapshot of the disk. Like you can bring the whole RAM back of its state, you know, while it's running. So that might be a nice interesting uh, to, to also see if it also works with FreeBSD. We've done this with binaries a lot, but not hmm. with um, a whole operating system yet. So that that also might be interesting to test as a like a testing mechanism, basically. Um, I'll have a look at that, but I have no knowledge. If anyone can point me to which uh, contributor or maintainer I should get in touch with for the Linux compat layer. Or maybe I should just maybe shoot an email to uh, FreeBSD hackers, as far as I can tell. Any questions for go Antronig? Go ahead. I was, I was going to say I would go with the FreeBSD hackers thing, or you could check the commit logs. I can't remember. Yeah, G Git log has shown yeah. me that all of the people who worked on the code were the people who were funded by the FreeBSD Foundation in the last three years, or mm -hmm. uh, all parts of the code. So that was very impressive. Thank you, Foundation. Um, and as far as I can tell, the whole job was done for like, you know, the, the KPI and stuff like that, you know, so um, uh, it, it, it's, it's pretty good there. Uh, and it's also very well documented, like in, it, there's, it's, it's, it, there's an actual comment with a, you know, hashtag to do that says need abstract sockets. These are not implemented yet. So that made my life a lot easier. See if you can uh, find who also, added that comment. Go ahead. Yes. And on a side note, D-Trace with the Linux Compat layer works beautifully. Like, I do not feel the need to run a free BSD native application to think, oh, there are some libraries or, you know, hooks miss missing. It's it's all works. Like, I think it's, it's using the CTF layer for stuff like that. So it, it works absolutely perfectly. Like, you can... Uh, which, by the way, Michael, in, in a VNet jail that's running Linux, you can also run PF. So like now you can have a Linux operating system. Oh, interesting. D trace okay. and PF. <laughs> okay. So... <laughs> Love it. I don't, I don't know whether we should crawl into holes and cry or applaud your or celebrate. Or, or yeah. Audacity. <laughs> well, <laughs> we can have nice things yeah. on yes, our terms. We can have nice things. Yes. <sighs> Cool. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm out. Too, too cool. Much, too yeah, much we're there. borderline off to topic, but all awesome. Jamie, any news to report or questions for the group? Oh, no, nothing as usual. Cool. Hey, you've had some awesome stuff. Uh, that said, uh, welcome, Till. Is this your first call? Not to put you on the spot. Let me quickly chew. Would you like to introduce yourself? Well, hi again. Hello. Uh, Welcome. I was here like months ago. Okay. Oh, cool. We did meet before. This uh, is Totuson, yeah? Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah, you go yeah. by a few names. Awesome. Yes. Uh, and thank you I again forget for I go your by this name fantastic so... Zones overview. Yeah. I forget I, get, I go by this name sometimes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
What's your mom call you? Anyway, um, what's new <laughs> in your world? Uh, not much, but aside from oxide stuff and and so on. Uh, are you working for oxide? No. Nope. Okay. Were you on the chat yesterday? No, in no internals. Sorry for you guys. <laughs> No, uh, we we get a few things, and it's more like uh, I'm with the Open Indiana project, so yep. a lot of maintenance, and since I'm back in Switzerland now again, uh, I was in Brazil, uh, yeah, it's basically like organizing everything and, and so on. Excellent. Are you doing so anything it... unique with uh, zones on Open Indiana? Um, just our usual brands, but uh, okay. I need, I need to check what I'm going to, I'm, I'm with the OCI project compatibility group now. So uh, did you catch Doug's, uh, introduction about that an update? Roughly. Okay. Um, uh, I know you guys are involved. That's, that's as far as I, how, how far I got. At a bare minimum, here's an introduction. <laughs> Doug, <laughs> till, till Doug. <laughs> hey. Ah. So, so I have noticed that, that there's a an, an OCI runtime extension for Solaris that was added, I'm going to say, several years ago. I'd have to check the commit logs. I'm not even sure whether, and this was done by Oracle, um, yep. but I'm not sure whether they ever produced a product that used it. But it would be um, kind of nice to have, to have, um, Illuminos, Illumos or, or one of the other successes to to be a viable OCI runtime. Yeah, this will have to be our own tools. Uh, yeah. There was a idea about Docker uh, some time ago, but the there is a certain little. Uh, problem called our mount syscall has eight arguments and right. golang just does not understand that okay i think that might have been covered in the so basically the 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 thing which i'm talking about the solaris thing was i i just read about read the um description of the interface between the container engine like container d or you know podman or whatever, and the um, container runtime. Um, so I'm, I, if they if they have a solution for mounts, I know that there was some talk of of you know uh, which mount types they supported. I don't know how they got around this this problem. It hasn't been um, an issue. Well, it, yeah, it hasn't. It's I, not I, even in the spec. Yeah. It's literally that the Golang programming language has two. Uh, function signatures for syscall right one with three arguments and oh, one I with six you. okay you know to be to be honest if i was writing a, a solaris oci runtime i'm not proposing that i do this i would absolutely <laughs> not do it in go yeah i've noticed Unlikely. this myself because i started with one and now i'm doing one in rust so yeah rust would be a good fit anything anything which i mean the main the main thing thing that makes it uh, clumsy to do this in Go is that the the language insists on controlling the thread model and it creates threads all over the place, which makes forking hard. Um, and in an OCI runtime, there's a very careful model around how how the runtime forks for the container, and it has to be really clear. And trying to make this work in in Golang is involves hundreds and hundreds of lines of code, which you just don't need. If you're doing it in C plus plus or Rust, I'm guessing that Rust doesn't do the same thing with its threading model. But if you're doing this in C plus plus or Rust, you just call fork. And if you're the child, you do the right thing. And if you're the parent, you do the right thing. If we actually fork, yeah, because I mean, the... Whatever, so the model is you you call create the the. Um, the call the the runtime's create method, it instantiates the container in whatever sense it is. So for jails, I create the jail, I fork, and the and the child will manage the jail and eventually become the container PID. And 
it was likely to be different with zones, obviously, but you, yeah. you're in control of, of this. And then later on, the, the engine will call the start method, which goes through the transition process of, of whatever you're doing to, to manage the gel turning into actually running the gel. So for me, it's the the PID that we forked off earlier um, attaches into the gel and execs the container um, workload. For zones, it's likely to be different. But this is all really easy in C++. If you're doing it in Go, it's a nightmare. Andrew Nick has a question. I just wanted to point out that I just looked inside Illumos gate, or rather Illumos gate for Joyent, um, and they do support the abstract sockets implementation. It's written by Patrick Mooney. Oh, of course. And, okay. uh, yeah, that's all I uh, one sec. Let me just kind of yes, it is written by, by Patrick Mooney, the whole code in 2015. Um, so it might be a good idea. And they don't use any um Illumosy things in there. It's just like you know, do some math with a C and spit up some number and keep that in memory and reuse it later again. So um uh, I, I, I think the license would allow to kind of copy pasta the code, but correct me if I'm not. I, I am not a lawyer, so well, or Patrick is definitely a friend of the family and might be willing to say, yeah, sure. Here's your BSD version of okay. that. Sneeze once okay. and it's done. I that is great. Thank you. It's off. It's yeah. Awesome. Ping him as soon as I figure out how to ping him. So I can help you with that. He was a regular on the Beehive calls early on, which yes, thank okay. you, him and Brian, etc. So uh back to the shortcomings of the Go threading model. Um, thank you, I mean, Till. Go is, is an okay language for, for, the, <laughs> for the engine. It's just, I feel like it's not the best implementation language for an OCI runtime. And this Fair is enough. why the, this is why, you know, originally there was, there was run C that is written in Go and it works, but C run, which is, um, the one that Podman folk wrote, um, is a lot simpler. It's more complicated than the, than my own OCI gel, but they've got the full feature set, and I only have a t the tiny piece that I that I wanted. Yeah, I also just need to basically make a translator between the zones and whatever we have as the zone wrapper already, right? Because we have the userland tools, and that's the interface. So whenever I want something that actually has some stability guarantees to work and not randomly break uh, in random Illumos versions. Uh, I will need to use the CLI versions. Uh, that's right. simple JSON transformation. So, Yeah. And that's kind of the same with gels, although I don't use the CLI. I'd use the syscall directly. Yeah, we have the. I feel, I feel like that ABI is pretty, has to be stable, otherwise it's going to screw everyone over. Yeah, we unfortunately only have door, because we can start the zone ADMD and give it commands through the door, okay. and that basically means the XML configuration needs to be set in place. Right. So you translate the. Um... The runtime config into an equivalent zone and then use the CLI to start with that zone. Yeah. Yeah. And then everything we do, we we have SMF inside anyway. We then just run a process inside and convert the rest if we mm -hmm. need something to do at boot. And you can so the um what am I trying to say? So how do you how do you manage the the um, paradigm of having a container PID that's visible in the host that that you can retrieve an um, exit code from when the container exits? This is really important for um, lots of lots of it embedded into um, lots of different um, tooling that you can run something in an isolation environment using a Docker command and get the return code out. And you get that happens by something waiting on a PID. We have is, a is very simple CLI. Those? Right. That login can do that. Okay. Cool. There is also the other way that 
as soon as, well, the, the basic thing is if I do this long running process, I basically need to boot the process via SMF and then mm -hmm. redirect its output to somewhere Docker can read it when I want it. But I don't strive for Docker compatibility. So I just need something that runs the OCI things that we can use the existing tooling roughly. Yeah. The rest is we use an API and lie our asses off. Yeah, I think it might. It's definitely worth spending a little bit of effort on getting stood, stood in, stood out, and stood out to, to play nice. Because mm. um, having, so one of the things is, is optional, but you can, with a container, you can have a, an automatically allocated pseudo TTY um, that that manages, that is stood in, stood out and so on. And that means you can attach into the running container and have all the um, support of having a, a real TTY that you can attach to. And yeah, for, um, Interactive workloads, it's really, really useful to have this. So there's a whole kind of palaver around the runtime creating the pseudo TTY and carefully sending the file descriptor up to the whatever it is, container D, um, using um, Unix domain socket control messages. Hmm. You don't need this right at the beginning. You can probably... Um, and wave that, but it is really, really useful when it works. Yeah, it's probably a case of actually having a proper TTI proxy for doors. It's like, mm -hmm. because we can pass file descriptor through doors, yeah. I can allocate the, the TTI inside the zone yeah. and simply have a door that's reachable from outside and ask for the right file descriptor for yeah. from any uh, outside thing. Or from any zone that can see the door. So I can make multi tenancy by basically having admin zones for people with a, just a subset of capability for certain zones. Interesting. Chris, do you have anything new OCI related? Hopefully you've caught up on the on the notes there. We've covered quite a few updates. I know your working group is interested in advancing this. Uh, not on OCI. No, I've got uh, some news on the VM state D stuff because I finally got it up on GitHub. Oh, I cool. think that is better a better fit for for the VHash call. Even though I probably won't be able to make it this week, but I'll send you a brief email. Okay, could you drop the link here? Because there are interested parties Absolutely, within yeah. reach. Cool. Rule number one, have your links handy. <laughs> cool, thank you. Uh, are uh, Doug and Chris, are you on the same page as to the efforts of the foundation and related to the, uh, the working, uh, the enterprise working group and OCI, I believe you are. I just yeah. want to make sure we're not missing the obvious. Okay, let's see. We lost Rod. Any news from anyone else? Uh, before the recording, I briefly talked to Doug about the uh, 9P work, which is more specific to Beehive, but he had a comment that it might occasionally hang while being used as a root file system, which completely buries the lead of it being able to be used as a root file system. I hope the <laughs> syntax is in there because that's sort of a holy grail for a yeah, lot yeah. of us virtualizing. No. I, I use it for kernel development. Um, it's fantastic. You, I, I create tiny virtual machines using package base. Oh and I use 9P to, to, be, to make that a root file system. Are your napkin notes can, available, like scribbly, po posted e notey notes? Because that's really. the holy I've grail. A, I'll, I've got an awful script that I use to, that I, that I just hack on the script to make it do whatever I'm trying to test at that point. But it, yes. it's super easy. You, is that you sanitizable and shareable? We're not here to reinvent a new yeah, wheel, but probably. Oh, please, thank yeah. you. Yes, <laughs> if you that's... send me the script, Doug, Doug, if you send me the script, Doug, I'll, cl I'll clean it up and make something pretty. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Basically, with with package base, you just use the package CLI tool. You 
use a there's a command line option to say actually do it in this cheroot and you just install a few packages into a cheroot um then run beehive with a 9p file system um statement pointing at that cheroot and yeah and i think you have to set a km to say what to basically tell the kernel what the root file system is and point that back at the the 9p and it works so um, you live in the promised land yeah i mean okay not everything Could works. share a little it's... bit and we'll gladly work out what's <laughs> missing because this okay. is the promised land i gave a talk on the layering of and nesting of file systems and the pain and suffering that comes from that so uh, I believe I can safely speak for all of us. We're all looking forward to that. Would love to try it and find yeah. any remaining issues. And, and thank you for having that having this kind of thing working. It it opens up a lot of things. It opens up perhaps an OCI runtime that was um, uses Beehive as an isolation um, rather than jail. Oh, um, that would be really neat. Yeah, yeah. Oh, get oh, me yeah. started on that. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Beehive, Beehive VMs managed via OCI. That would be interesting. Or are we talking they like this, uh, direct 9P? Um, this would be 9P over. So Beehive uses v Virtio as a transport for 9P. Mm. Um, although there is there's a fuse over Virtio, which I need to find more out about this is a the the new way of doing of sharing host file system um with with um vms um so we can finally yeah. make fsw <laughs> FreeBSD uh, subsystem for windows oh my. <laughs> yes <laughs> please oh okay <laughs> <laughs> do we want that uh we don't for want what they have. <laughs> for certain applications, you, it is still needed to run a certain <clears> one <throat> binary in a jail. Dave, anyone can guide me on what's missing because I have like um I'm in a location where my like my university students are using UTM to boot free BSD. Everyone's happy, but then Windows users are suffering with things like VirtualBox and Hyper V, you know. But having okay. uh, uh, a window, a, a window subsystem for free PSD that would be perfect, and I couldn't get it to work. Honestly, I just couldn't figure out. I, I, I gave it the file and converted some disk images, and I, I could never get it to mm -hmm. boot. Basically, and it, it kept complaining, you know. So, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that that would be actually very nice. I think we can even convince Microsoft to put that in their. Uh, what do they call that? Their app store, you know, where, where people download Linux images. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it would be very uh, cool also from a development perspective. Like now we can have a whole new bunch of developers there uh, coming in because now the path to free BSD might be a lot shorter. Yeah. And I know that was an initiative of the enterprise working group. Uh Okay, Chris, you have a follow-up question. Just let her rip. I just read about the different approaches that you uh, apparently walked through uh, previously. I'm just wondering, I think I mentioned this during the little recent call. I'm wondering whether an approach with using KQK events to kind of signal whoever is interested in state changes in jails whether that wouldn't also be a possible approach to, you know, sim in a very simple fashion with very low overhead, um, also for the listeners to mm -hmm. actually get a grip on what is going on with the jails uh, on the system. And I don't know when a, when a jail is being instantiated or when it is being destroyed, I think it should be fairly easy to add that into the, uh, into the relevant kernel code, even though, Obviously, I think we all know getting this kind of code changes and to base might be a problem set of its own. But on the other hand, I think when it comes to the um, how much effort and what will be gained, then I think that um, the ratio might might still be interesting. I, I, at least that would be my take. But nonetheless, maybe I'm missing something and maybe there's another reason why this doesn't make any sense. So I'm just wondering 
if anyone even thought about that and what, what your thoughts are. Okay, no takers, I guess. I, for one, cannot say. Um... Jamie, any thoughts? Gut reaction? Mm, no, just kind of uh, listening to try to see what other people going. I haven't really gone anywhere in this. Does the question need any further clarification? No, I just um, I just have no thoughts. Yeah. So, uh, Chris, keep keep letting that formulate in your head and. If there's a super simple proof of concept, go for it. But if not, let's just explore it. That's what I'm thinking on the other end. You know, I'm, I don't want to. I don't want to create a uh, a huge bank of of unfinished stuff at the end of the day. Now I started with this VM state D thing. Um, that's also kind of unfinished. I don't. I don't know where where that's going to go. Uh, whether that is even where uh, worthwhile to follow up on. Um, so. Yeah, let's see. Um, if, if I've got time, if um, if there is no meaningful further um, reason to um, to keep working on VM state D, uh, the stuff that I started, maybe I'm going to shift over to that and do some kind of proof of concept on, on this. Uh, makes sense. Well, scratch uh, any and all appropriate ball. itches. Um, yeah, are there? How far along would you say VM state D is? Is that something for us to all give a try? I think it is. I think it is in a it is in a triable state. I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily recommend putting it into production, but um, I think it is. I mean, first of all, it would be great to get some feedback on the on the on the code quality, I suppose, because um, I'm 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 not really <laughs> I might probably not be the best C coder. I don't know. Um. So there might be things to do better, particularly when it comes to more tourist code. And um, and yeah. there's definitely there's definitely a bunch of functionality missing. I, I already know that. And I've I've got a bunch of things that I that I also put into the man page, caveats to watch out for, you know. And I've got a few tiny things that I want to clean up and and, and put in. I've already uh, put a ports make file into the repository, but I'm I haven't gotten around to do a footer air run, so I haven't posted it on on, uh, on Bugzilla yet to get into the actual which uh, listing. But let's say it's ninety nine percent there, so it's only a question of time until I've got it. I've got the files. Cool. Could you kindly do a brain dump into the readme of just how to build it and get started? Just. Because with all these new tools, uh, knowing what it looks like is important because people will come with whatever yes. experience they have from another tool and think it works just like they did uh, Easy Jail or whatever tool you can think of oh. and think, oh, it must work like, like what I used previously. And that's generally not the case. Yes, I can do that. I'm going to put a readme into the GitHub. And um, cool. I think that should probably that be, would be a huge step yeah, forward boy, just think, to get feedback yeah, and otherwise. Uh, Cool. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Okay. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, there are a few uh, near topics, not off topics, but near topics. But uh, any other jail OCI points to cover? And I sense two plus ones on this choice of day. Anyone else beyond Doug and Till liking or hating this day? Those are strong words. Sorry. It's definitely better for me. Thanks. Okay. There's three plus ones. Yeah. That works for me. And it uh, it remains to be seen what we will do with the freed up Wednesday morning, because that's not a Friday, which is <laughs> Friday evenings in Europe are not probably a hot a uh, moment for uh, such talks. But one idea that came up yesterday was a proposal of a 
periodic D-trace call, and it sounds like uh, Antrenig, you've found some D-trace issues. Yes. How about this? If you have any interest in D-trace, stick around. Otherwise, I wish you a fantastic week, and uh, we will talk perhaps later this week on another call or next week on the jail zones call. Yeah. But feel free to drop off. Thank you. I won't call it an official stop because Entrenic, uh, there's a key seed to plant insofar as it seems D-Trace is getting uh, a little reduced love across the the, the world. Do you have, yeah, I don't want example, to say you... I'm uninterested in D-Trace, but I do need to leave. So. Okay, super. Thank yeah. you, Doug. Thanks. Excellent. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you very much, Doug. Okay. Okay, Kyrie. So, um, D-Trace bug. Um, let's see if Till can help us with this. Actually, and yeah, you posted one in a different chat just the other day. You said, here, I found the smoking gun. Yes, sir. So here's a very basic D-Trace script. Okay. All it does is it includes the socket file. Okay. And the reason why you want to do this is if you want to read data from memory, and you want to parse it properly, let's say if the, the memory in there is some kind of a struct, right? You want to know what the struct looks like, the size of it and everything, and D-Trace will match that for you. So you can convert a bunch of data to a specific size of a struct and read the struct directly with you know, the dot operator or the arrow operator. So that's the basic idea of it. Okay, so here's the problem. As soon as you start running this the proper way, which is you know, dash CH, C for run the C pro processor, S for script, it's going to give you an error that says one of the types has been redeclared. In this case, it's int 8t for some reason. And you can add the H option, which will show you how the CPP is parsing things, the exact order of things, who's you know merging who. And uh, this is the issue that I'm having here, basically. That uh, that that what is named that um, uh, int t is redefined somewhere, right? So there's an easy way to you know spot this by the eye, by the human eye is actually running CPP on the dtrace code itself. Uh, bug uh, less, okay. And this is what the output of CPP looks like, the C preprocessor. So somewhere in here, underscore underscore. Uh, I think it was uint8 underscore t is being redefined. Now, I went over this CPP a millions of times, and I still cannot find where it was being redefined. I only see it in a single place. It's in here. It's only in a single place. It's in here. It's in sys types. But I don't know why I'm getting it with dtrace, that issue. Now, one of the ideas that I have is maybe it's declared in sys types as well as x86 types. So now it's like, okay, like, is it, is it like a copy pasta of the same file? Is that why we're having an issue? So I don't know, but this is the actual problem. And this happens with not all, but the majority of the include that you're doing that relies on a network socket, which is, it, it needs the types because of the Indianness, and Indianness, 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 Indianness. Indianness. Yeah, Indianness, exactly. And uh, that's why it needs to understand how the types look like. So this is the problem that I'm, I'm I'm having, and this has been around since FreeBSD thirteen dot one. So like for two now three major releases, no one has noticed this as far as I can tell. I I went over Bugzilla. Hopefully, I did Google and uh, search properly, but I might be wrong. So um, this is my Dtrace story. So I, I have no idea how to fix this. One of the ideas that I had, and I did discuss it with Adam, and he's like, that is not a feature that you actually want. Like, uh, it is, it's a scenario that you don't know what you're actually saying. It's like, can we add a D-trace flag that allows type redeclaration? But basically, that's a very bad thing to do. And very, very various things can go badly with a, you know, an, an insecure or bad written C code. So that's apparently not a good idea. So we have to fix the headers in uh, in FreeBSD or figure out what Dtrace is doing and what we are not doing to make Dtrace happy. So yeah, this is the long story short version. Um, uh, that's as far as I can tell. Ask me any questions. I've played around with this a lot just to see which things are working, which things are not. And uh, um, majority of the includes are having this problem. 
it's definitely free BSD related. The yes. Illumos doesn't have it. Yes, I tried it on um, uh, Omni OS. I didn't have any issues, so uh, I'm pretty sure it's it's a problem on our side. Uh, I thought it could be a bug, like maybe a parsing bug that somehow it happened in FreeBSD. But um, I went over the code of of Dtrace as well. There is like nothing that could indicate any problem like this. So um, yeah, kind of sad about that. Does a script with a uh... A program actually have the same bug because we have a. I get the bug about the the D program being empty. Like completely empty? No, it doesn't even well, get there. No, it, it for me it gets an error. Fail to compile script D trace bug D, line four empty D translation unit. Exactly. Oh, did you add the dash C capital in D trace? Yeah. Okay, so you're just getting a regular bug that the you know file is empty. I think if I if I remove that line from here, let's see, D trace bug. If I remove the line that says include C socket and I run the exact same thing again, I will get the same thing, empty D program translation unit. It, it just says that this is not a D program. I cannot use this code basically. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that, that that's totally normal, yes. Yeah, mm. so it's definitely a FreeBSD thing. And I, 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 I mean, Dtrace is pretty much battle tested. Sometimes in a you know a literal sense, as far as I can tell, for some countries. So um, uh, this is definitely not uh, a Dtrace thing. This this is definitely a FreeBSD thing. And okay, yeah, so go on. How I'm, in I'm, sync I'm, I'm... are the two Dtraces? Has there been any significant development on either platform such no that idea. they're out of sync? Okay, that's kind of st step I have one. No idea. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And there's also open dtrace, I think it's called, which is like the GitHub repository for the, you know, that the open ZFS thing of dtrace. Oh, great. Know. Yes. Okay. Uh, that's that's GitHub slash open dtrace, basically. Oh, okay. and, um, and there's a lot of code in there. There is the RFDs uh, request for something. I have no idea. Uh, request for, request for discussion. There is the Darwin extensions. There is the Mac OS D trace, which is open source. The free BSD source tree, Illumos gate. Um, there is the toolkit, uh, the D trace yeah. toolkit. There's a like it, there's a lot of things in in there. But uh, like the last thing that it was updated was in 2022, and it was documentation and in text. So I'm pretty sure that D trace is not getting the love it needs in the open dtrace framework i'm sure smart os guys and joint guys or the triton data center guys and then oxide guys are doing their own thing but as a project of its own it's kind of uh, falling behind and uh, FreeBSD hasn't merged any new dtrace code for uh, at least a release that's Antranig, have, have you filed a problem report i have not because i i don't understand the problem well, true, but give the tea leaves you have, and they seem to be super simple, such that the Mark Johnstons of the world may blink twice and see what's wrong. So I'd say get it out there and carefully worded. But is is it truly a one-line yes. uh, file that's choking? Well, that's very tangible. Yes. It's not like, yes. oh, it has trouble yeah. after I, three I, months I, of uptime. I tried so. it. I tried it on various versions. I tried it uh, everything 13.1 and up. So 13.1, 13.2, soon also 13.3. I tried it on the stable. Plan. Okay. Then and 14, it's all failing. Yeah. Uh, not that you want to bisect this for a week, but there's clearly some moment between what 13 and 13.1 that something changed. Um, yes. Some of that might be yeah. obvious just roaming through the Git tree history but and, and my log. team has spent like a week like three people spending a week looking into the header files we could not get cpp to tell us if that type the uint uh eight type has been redefined like from the cpp perspective everything is fine but then dtrace comes and it has a very strict parsing to be honest and it's like no no, no it's not fine you're, you're doing it really clear unfortunately i don't know maybe i can dtrace dtrace and see where okay. it's you know, yeah, okay. like there. that's a whole different story. Never mind. So just how many Clang updates have we had during this time? And maybe that's related. I don't know. Could be. Also, we added uh, more support for things like RISC-V in the, you know, from 13 on. So 
that might because there's you know very different things in the types uh, header file that we've changed specifically for those systems so that might also have an effect again i i have no knowledge about this like me i'm looking at I don't, know, I don't want to say Arabic. I'm looking at Chinese, you know. I only know Ni Hao, which is, you know, the error, and that's all I can all I, right. I, I can understand in this. Well, you're not alone. Get a super simple, clear uh report out there. And if you do have a moment, just see what obvious components in 13 to 13 1 may have changed. Um in a perfect world with as described 9P and build artifacts, you could quickly uh smoke test this yeah. and bisect this in a heartbeat and that's why these tools are so exciting it's like well splat it down buddha splat it down fyi read me as i'm good thank you chris oh so chris you just posted that you rock thank you yes uh i will i i will be adding detrace probes to your system if, if there's one thing i can do with detrace is adding detrace probes to any application so <laughs> that this is going to be fun Okay, yeah, that's a great start. Oh, perfect, even with the package. Now that's completeness. And then uh, if usability is covered in a manual, great. But if not, just just give us a the, the crash course. Awesome, thank you, Chris. There is, yes, there is, ma'am. <laughs> uh, I can add that also to the readme. Awesome, great work. Okay, well, that's plenty right now on Dtrace with some actionable steps. Um, I don't know if anyone here beyond Entrenig is using CARP, but a completely distantly related, it's not clear if there is out there a lovely PF slash CARP um, audit, for lack of a better term, of the CARP friendly applications and which ones are not from be it NFS, be it SMB, be it as simple as an SSH session. So I'm hearing people say, oh no, WireGuard will fail under CARP. Well, it's probably not WireGuard. It's probably what you're doing on WireGuard, et cetera, et cetera. So if anyone's able to shed some light on that, let's shed it, but it doesn't have to be here and now. Uh, did you say IPF or CARP overall? Uh, CARP and PF. I didn't say IPF. Oh, no. uh, Just... CARP, yeah, CARP and PF, there's PF sync. Right, so... And we can have that conversation separately. I just want to plant that seed and get it out there. Yeah. Okay, and we've covered... Go ahead. I would just want to say, if this D-Trace thing starts a, a revolution in the, you know, in, inside the D-Trace community in FreeBSD, and maybe hopefully the Lumos people might get interested, I would be very happy. If not, I mean, there's the, the work on D-Trace is hard compared to everything else. So if not weekly, then bi-weekly Wednesday calls for even half an hour for D-Trace. Uh, I think it would be very useful for the users more than the developers, honestly. Yeah, we can't let it atrophy. So much work has gone into it. It does such amazing things. And I don't know if you quite realize the power of what you said, but D-Tracing Linux on on FreeBSD or, was or, or Lumos awesome. Is, is, so yeah. it's like, like there you waters. go. Do we have a better environment yeah. for doing what they're like, trying like, to do? <laughs> like, like, and even in Illumos land, like you can have a Linux with crossbow and D-trace and a proper firewall in, in 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 a Linux container. You know, in a Linux in a Linux branded zone, it's like it's like Linux. Now you, all of your problems have been solved. You know, so <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, that's 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 would be interesting. I'm going uh, to highlight that bright red because that was a profound observation because we have nice tools let's as is often the case let's discover the nice tools we have and use them what a concept and to make you even happier if you copy slash rescue into the uh Chirut or the jail linux jail yep. uh you can also use zfs inside of linux so if you do zfs delegation to a jail that is a linux jail now you can have proper zfs inside linux so there's also that, like you're running free BSD ZFS inside the Linux container without, because it's, it's statically compiled, compiled and everything without any problem. Like the, 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 the sky is not even the limit anymore when it comes to stuff like this. We just need a better compat layer. Okay. Copy rescue into a jail, was it you said? Yes. And have... So we have a slash rescue in free BSD. 
Um, what's different about slash rescue is that it's a statically compi yeah. compiled. So it doesn't rely yep, on yep. the runtime and everything else. So you put that inside Linux. I usually copy it inside the slash native inside Linux. Uh, <laughs> very, very uh, smart OS uh, inspired there. And I just yeah. run the ping and the if config and ZFS and dtrace. Well, we don't have dtrace there. And, and all of these other utilities from inside of there. So one of the beautiful things that we can do on the source code layer is that you can go, let's say, to the source code of PF. And instead of doing make, you do uh, I don't know, flag static equals yes, make. So now you have PF that is statically compiled. Then you put that PF inside the Linux container. There you go. Now you have proper PF without any issues. You want to have, um, uh, tell me anything that is you know not Linuxy out there. You want to have uh, program X that we provide inside the Linux container. You compile it statically. You put it inside slash native. Now you have it there. Have without a nice any day. Problems. Wow. So uh, yeah, um, even if it's dynamically compiled, it's absolutely possible. It's just a little bit of hassle. But a little more hassle. Yeah. And I've been doing that for a couple of weeks now, and it's 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 completely fine. Yeah, I was about to say we basically just mount the root file system on the slash native. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> and then we have every <laughs> everything dynamically compiled. Yes, yes. And for the I security, I should try that too. I I haven't tried that yet. And for the security concern, once we did once the trick of just simply installing a second image onto the disk and mounting that, so we don't have the live root file system inside the zone, and uh, that works perfectly as well. So, so in in your slash native, you have a whole uh, Illumo system like SmartOS or OmniOS or OpenGL running in there. Not running in there, just the binaries. Okay, so just the binary, and but they are dynamically com uh, compiled, right? Not statically. Yes, dynamic. Do you ship the libraries inside the next container or inside slash native? Uh, we ship. Nothing inside slash native. Slash native is basically just a loopback mount to slash. To slash. Okay. So if if I run a slash native bin D trace, assuming it's in there, um, it will look for you know the Illumos runtime, right? So var no, sorry, user lib ld.so, for example. And will it look will it look for that inside of Linux or inside of slash native? Because that's the slash issue native. I'm having. Uh, did did you do magic for that, or do you like just change an environment? You just added your path, or happens? what? Uh, yeah, we I have mean... relative paths. Oh, 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 okay, okay, okay. Oh, that's smart. So you don't compile the binary with like slash lib. You compile it with dot dot slash. Yeah. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. That's very small. I mean, for free BSD is like a three line change in our make file and we can get that to work we have that concept since ips this is actually an uh, inheritance of ips oh, oh yeah of course of course the ips packaging started doing that so you can ship an application with its libraries all together right okay 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 yeah it's you guys uh, have had, uh, several uh, features in ips also rely on that because yeah, we yeah, have a yeah. uh, user uh, user compiled images, so users can make images where they can compile when they can install applications without needing to be root. Okay, and and yeah, like similar to packet source, yes. And yep. uh, and uh, does does um, what's his name? Does Open Indiana use IPS? Yes. Okay, and OmniOS used. I don't remember what it used. IPS. IPS as well. Okay. okay. Only SmartOS is on uh, package source. Okay. Okay. Yeah, SmartOS one... is the only one that has the, like, we don't have a package manager, but we have package source for everything else. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everybody yeah, else yeah. can use package source. It's like, it's basically an additional package manager. Yeah. Uh, and there was a weird one that used Debian's APT as a package manager. That, that was a very different. Yeah, that's the Russians. Yeah. That's the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was just the, like the perfect thing. It's like, oh, who uses app as package match? Oh, it's the Russians. <laughs> of course they do. Oh, that's that's very funny. I love that. Okay. <laughs> yes. Somehow okay. during uh, because IPS is a successor of Apt, mm -hmm. 
uh, because it was made by the same person. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And somehow some APT developers from Russia got in or somehow. It's like, it's a very weird connection story. That's very interesting. Very, very interesting. Yeah, I understand his soul. Yeah, he did amazing work on IPS after learning all the mistakes from APT indeed. Yeah, yeah. That was a, yeah. Yeah. Is IPS was... getting much traction? I'm not uh, not coming across it very often. It's, it's hard to port. Okay. It oh. has a couple of things that are very hardly Nick. tied in into the system. Okay. Um, Technically, those could be replaced out because they're C libraries. Yeah. But then again, nobody likes Python, so. Hmm. And correct me if I'm wrong. Like from from an administration perspective, what would my main differences be between Open Indiana and OmniOS? Because I this 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 is the one that I don't understand. Open Indiana and OmniOS, they seem so much alike, and yet totally different distributions. Well, for one, they're forks. Number two, it, yeah, OmniOS is an open Indiana fork. Oh. Uh, the basically the the only difference is that at some point Dan McDonald uh, needed to do actual work and he got fed up too much with the people not wanting to move forward, and he was like, "Well, I can fight with people or I can do my own thing." As we have fork, yeah. As a motto, and he fought. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay. That ended up with essentially OmniOS group. Uh, Dan left at some point. Andy took over as a freelance yeah. guy, uh, together with Dominic and the other guys. Yeah. Then they're now at Oxide. Um, but basically, the those two are the OmniOS and OpenIDIAN are the big two. Um, we kind of try to get along since then. It's like always like a little bit parallel getting along and having different philosophies kind of a deal. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it, in any time it could also happen. There's talks about the remerge, uh, coming up again, like at least already the second time. Oh my. Well, every time a community starts to run out of people, we started talking about the remerge because, well, we people and we're working on each other's operating systems. And yeah. We actually like each other. We know each other personally. Uh, and everybody's like, well, should we merge? How will we do it? And every time we started talks about more people show up. So. And, 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 and Open Indiana does not have Linux branded zones, right? No. That's okay. actually a speciality for OmniOS. Neither Helios okay. nor uh, Open Indiana have it. Helios, that's the new uh, Oxide. That's Oxide, yeah. Yes. yes, okay. Oh, what's yeah, the name of their one? Helios? Helios. 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 Oh, of Helios. course. Helios, yeah. like the Sun God. Like yeah. the Sun they God. Took, they, took the, they took the Sausage Factory out, finally. <laughs> so we haven't discussed triplets which I will say was such a cool merger of like a open BSD feel and a Sun workstation feel all at once. I, I was pleasantly surprised by it. That's that's Peter. Yeah. Uh, for for anybody that wants to know Triplex, Triplex is Peter. Okay, yeah, basically. He, Peter does Peter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we all love him for doing it. And we uh, thank him for it, exactly. <laughs> Uh, oh and it God. just it just works for for what he does for it. It's 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 brilliant. Yeah. Uh, personally, whenever I need something really really small, yeah, I go for triplex. Cool. Uh, because if if it's really like oh I I don't even want to bother with like more memory for ZFS, it's like really a small node. Just install it and it runs the ZFS base services and it runs. Yep. Absolutely. Anything else? Okay, we so have covered a fantastic set of topics. Bahamut just answered me, by the way. Uh, Till, remind me, what was Bahamut's name? I, I always forget. Brian Horstman Allen. Yes, he's part of the uh, new uh, Triton Data Center team. And uh, he answered me. I asked him, like, what's the actual implementation doing in Illumos's LX branded zones, uh, so abstract Linux socket implementation? 
and apparently whenever they see it's an abstract socket, they convert it into a non-abstract socket. That's <laughs> that's their solution to it. Oh. It's like, oh, <laughs> let's just convert it to a non-abstract socket. So, uh, yeah. Sounds like you've made some great progress on that during the call. Yeah. Like uh, I, I personally uh, think that that's a security issue, by the way. Because like you're writing inside TMP, you know, so maybe the whole point of having an abstract socket is to not make it available on the file system. But I'll, I'll, I'll think a little bit more. Maybe I can use our socket pair solution, but I'm not sure yet. I'll, I'll figure something out. This, this will be this will end up being my 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 introduction into FreeBSD kernel development, as far as I can tell. <laughs> yeah. You're already there, whether you realize it or not. <laughs> <laughs> it's also I think that there is a way to have a socket that does not have a representative on a file system. Yeah, attach it to a file descriptor. Just create an FD and attach it to that. Yeah, basically, then you just need to remember the file descriptor when somebody requests yeah. it. Yes, yes, and then pass it around. And then, I mean, it will automatically clean up by the kernel as soon as the process dies, yes. Uh, but apparently on Illumos, it acts, if you ask for zero foo, it will create TMP. So, which is not a bad solution, to be honest. Like, it's, it is the fastest, dirtiest way to get it done. Yeah, and probably if you're asking for uh, an abstract socket, probably Linux does the same, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, Unless you can they... you can do you you can do sockets on an FD if if you want on Linux. Oh, now that's actually interesting. I know you can do a socket, a Unix socket on a file descriptor on the BSDs, but maybe a Linux doesn't have that. Maybe that's why they created the abstract sockets. That might be a reason. Good question. Uh, not, yeah. yeah, I I haven't I haven't looked into the internals. I I need to have a look for that. That's a yeah, very good point. That that that's the question. If what happens with an abstract socket on Linux, and what happens if you call that from a random other program? Like, can they all of a sudden communicate, or is there a security boundary at all on Linux? Yeah. Okay. Well, folks, I'm out. Go. I still have some work to do. And uh, Michael, do you want to stop recording, or do we want to go? Uh, I think continue? we'll call the official meeting, and then if okay. anyone wants to hang out for a sec, Let's do it. So I'm calling it at 11.21 a.m. Pacific. Thank you, everyone. Perhaps you'll be on tomorrow for the ZFS call. Like and subscribe. <laughs> like and subscribe to this video on YouTube. <laughs> exactly. Oh, Toasterson, you know exactly what that implies. Thank you very much. <laughs>